Thank you for taking the time to view this presentation on innovative utility rate restructuring. Economics drives change, and we hope the next few minutes will help the viewer understand why the creation of an inverted utility rate structure in North Carolina is one of the most important steps we can take toward ensuring a sustainable energy and economic future. First, let's define what we mean by a sustainable energy future. Reducing energy consumption through efficiency and conservation is the most important element of providing long-term sustainability. This will allow us to reduce production sources helping to preserve our health and environment. It will also create new industries and jobs in the field of energy efficiency. The second element of sustainability is a complete transformation to renewable energy production using technologies to capture the potential of the sun, the wind, geothermal heat, ocean waves, and tides. This transformation also offers enormous economic opportunities with the promise of many thousands of new jobs for professionals, construction, and maintenance workers. The third essential element of sustainability is the phasing out of inefficient, expensive, and environmentally destructive technologies that burn coal and other fossil fuels, or rely on nuclear fusion to boil water for steam turbines to generate electricity. These technologies result in respiratory and other pulmonary health conditions for human beings, as well as mountaintop removal mines, toxic ash piles and ponds, acid rain, mercury toxicity, nuclear waste accidents and proliferation, and dependency on oil from sometimes unfriendly and unreliable suppliers around the world. If we respect the results of extensive research performed by the worldwide scientific community, we need to rapidly reduce greenhouse gases by 80% to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. Nobody knows exactly when the tipping point will be reached, but I think most would agree that the sooner we can accomplish this transformation, the better off we'll be. Following successful historical examples such as the Apollo Project, the Manhattan Project, and the massive national industrial conversion at the beginning of World War II, Let's set a goal of mobilizing our resources and making the transition within 10 years. Is this a realistic goal to set for transforming to a sleek, efficient, and 100% renewable energy system in North Carolina and in our nation? Let's listen to what some leading scientists, economists, and political experts have to say. Most of the energy we use in the United States and throughout the world is wasted by inefficient technology for turning energy into the services we want, like hot showers and cold beer. And everybody has percentages that they're throwing out. Oh, we'll have 20%, maybe 10%, maybe 25%. The most we've seen is 50%. And there's no need to look at it as a piecemeal approach. Renewables can satisfy 100% of our energy and transportation needs quite easily. Right now we have a marketplace that is rigged to reward the dirtiest, filthiest, most addictive, most destructive, most damaging fuels from hell rather than the cheap, clean, green, abundant, safe, and wholesome fuels from heaven. And we need to switch that around and rationalize our marketplace. And if we do that, we turn every America, we democratize the power system in our country. That's what you guys are fighting for, democracy in this country. We're going to democratize the power system so that every American becomes part of this process. We turn every home into a power plant every American into an energy entrepreneur, and we power our country based upon American initiative, energy, entrepreneurship, imagination, what, what Franklin Roosevelt said, American industrial genius. So one of the great companies here in California is a company called Google. It's doing pretty well. And they've laid out a plan to retire all the coal plants by 2030. They have laid out the mix of wind and but solar and storage and efficiency. And we, the notion that we actually have to have increasing demand, I, it's Bruce, not based I, on science. Can, what has become clear? from the science is that we cannot burn all of the fossil fuels without creating a very different planet. 
The only practical way to solve the problem is to phase out the biggest source of carbon, and that is coal. The science is very clear on that, but yet the decision makers are not taking the actions that are needed to do that. In fact, everybody who saves energy makes money at it, so I don't see why it should be costly either. Uh, in fact, it's one of the biggest economic bonanzas out there, and if we're looking for a stimulus package, let's use energy in a way that saves money. This will get rid of uh, the oil problem, the climate problem, the nuclear proliferation problem, uh, a lot of the global development problem, and a lot of others, uh, not at a cost but at a profit. The biggest obstacle to protecting the climate is the assumption that it's going to cost money. It's actually very profitable because it's cheaper to save energy than to buy it. Efficiency is cheaper than fuel. And somehow the economic theorists who keep talking about cost, burden, and sacrifice got the sign wrong. They confused a plus and a minus sign. So we're arguing about the wrong thing. We should be arguing about profits, jobs, and competitive advantage. Who's going to get it? How fast? So today, I challenge our nation to commit to producing 100% of our electricity from renewable energy and truly clean carbon-free sources within 10 years. It's time for us to move beyond empty rhetoric. We need to act now, and we need to act boldly. Is it unrealistic to cut our energy consumption in half? Not according to this article from Lowe's webpage explaining exactly how to do just that. If we have the practical means to dramatically reduce energy consumption, if we have well-respected economists telling us the transition to efficiency will not be a sacrifice, but rather an economic bonanza, if we have political leaders challenging us to set a 10-year goal for a complete transformation to renewable energy, if the worldwide scientific community is informing us that we need to act quickly in phasing out non-renewable energy production to preserve a livable world for future generations, then why isn't this yet happening on a massive scale? What will compel us to act? The reality is that most people and institutions gain motivation to act when it affects our wallets. When we are confronted with immediate opportunities to save money, most of us will take advantage of the situation. For instance, when the price of gasoline rises above a certain threshold, people begin to buy smaller cars and drive less, as documented in this article from the Associated Press. Does it follow that the only way to reduce energy consumption is through imposing higher costs on all electrical ratepayers? Not necessarily, but the current utility rate structure gives us the opposite incentive. For example, this rate table taken from a Duke Energy publication discloses that using more energy is rewarded by lower rates once the consumer uses more than 350 kilowatt hours each month. On the other hand, if we use innovative rate restructuring, conservation and investment in efficiency can be rewarded with lower rates, while wasteful energy use can be discouraged with higher rates. Another choice available to homeowners, businesses, and industry is to invest in solar energy or cogeneration systems to supplement their energy resources and avoid paying the higher tiered rates if they can't reduce their usage below the low tier threshold. Many ratepayers may take this option because the new rate structure will create an economic imperative for them to do so. They will profit from this investment by saving on energy costs. It should be noted that this presentation uses the threshold of 350 kilowatt hours per month purely as an example to illustrate the principles involved in using an inverted rate structure. In reality, the rate structure would be somewhat more complex based on the number of people or rooms per household, for instance. 
In some existing programs in other states, there are more than two rate tiers. One program in California, for example, has five tiers. In this North Carolina proposal, designing a fair and equitable tiered rate structure would be the responsibility of the North Carolina Utilities Commission using a set of legislatively mandated guidelines that would result in substantial statewide reductions in energy consumption while providing the percentage of profit guaranteed by law to our regulated utility industry. This table illustrates how investing in efficiency can pay off on a monthly basis and how an inverted rate structure works to favor that investment even more. For example, if a ratepayer were to borrow $720 to replace a pre-1992 refrigerator with a comparably sized 2010 Energy Star model, the monthly payment on the loan would be less than the cost of the energy saved on the utility bill. With an inverted tiered rate structure in place, a further and perhaps more important benefit is that the new refrigerator uses 104 kilowatts less per month than the old one. This would go a long way toward keeping the ratepayer's monthly energy use below the higher tier threshold, substantially lowering the cost of operating all other electrical appliances in the house as well. As shown on the chart, the homeowner can take it a step further by investing in a solar-powered refrigerator and dedicated solar array for $2,200, displacing all the energy of the old refrigerator and once again helping to keep the monthly utility bill within the lower tier rates. This same process can be performed with clothes washers, dishwashers, and virtually any other electrical appliance. Most other investments in efficiency measures that tighten houses by sealing leaks and insulating from energy loss have even more pronounced financial benefit. The investment in efficiency always pays for itself. An inverted utility rate structure can be used to level out peak demand as well. This is very important because by leveling out peak demand, we can close all polluting peak power plants and several baseload plants that currently run continuously, providing a tremendous overcapacity only to ensure that enough power is available during the short periods of peak usage. By charging upper tier rates for peak power usage and staggering ratepayers within zones for these higher costs, Electrical consumers can and will avoid substantial use of energy at these times. This can be done without discomfort or inconvenience by a small investment in automatic timers for electric water heaters, heat pumps, and other space conditioning equipment. By leveling out peak demand, the utility industry will realize a dramatic reduction in the cost of producing energy due to the closure of numerous power plants but the now dispersed total energy used and sold during peak hours will remain relatively constant. This translates into a substantial excess profit for the industry. In North Carolina, the utility industry as a regulated monopoly is guaranteed and limited to approximately a 12.5% return on all capital expenditures. If revenues exceed this percentage of profit, Normally, rates would be lowered to compensate, but as part of this proposal, instead the money would be deposited in a public benefit fund. Let's come back to this in a moment. One potential pitfall of an inverted rate structure is that if we're not careful, it could negatively impact low-income people who are struggling to get by and who can't, under current circumstances, afford to make immediate investments in energy efficiency or solar energy systems for their homes, even if those investments would help them economically in the long run. In this proposal, qualifying low-income families will be given a two-year grace period after the program is implemented 
in which to improve the efficiency of their homes so they can achieve the lowest rates and save money. In addition, low interest loans and in some cases grants will be made available through the Public Benefit Fund or PBF to qualifying low income families so they can make their homes more energy efficient. The PBF will essentially be a new bank administered by an independent agency that manages the accounting on all utility bills. There will be at least three sources of income for the PBF. Initial funding will come from a 5% excise tax on all non-Energy Star electrical appliances beginning in the first year following passage of the rate restructuring legislation. One year later, once the new rate structure comes into effect, all upper tier revenues collected in excess of the utility industry's warranted profits will also be deposited in the PBF. And finally, all excess utility profits gained from the closure of peak power and baseload plants, as mentioned earlier, will feed the public benefit fund where the money will be used to invest in still more energy efficiency, creating an ongoing cycle of ratcheting down energy consumption adding more renewable energy sources and creating a more decentralized or distributed statewide energy system that will in itself be much less wasteful than the inherently less efficient, highly centralized energy production and delivery system we have now. To give fair and adequate notice to all ratepayers, Starting one year prior to implementation of the new rate structure, monthly utility bills would look something like this example. In addition to informing the customer of the amount owed for this month's electricity bill, there is an explanation of the coming changes. The ratepayer is informed of how much money will be saved this month in the following year if suggested efficiency and conservation goals are met. Alternatively, the customer learns how much more it will cost the following year if the same number of kilowatt hours is consumed for that month, assuming it exceeds the low cost threshold. On the back of the utility bill will be a list of suggestions for reducing energy consumption, beginning with things you can do for free, like turning down thermostats, using a clothesline instead of an electric dryer, closing off and not heating rooms that aren't being used, and wearing a sweater instead of turning up the heat. Next is a list of moderate investments like buying more efficient light bulbs, fixing plumbing leaks, and insulating all hot and cold water pipes. And finally, there is a list of large investments like installing a ground source heat pump, a solar water heater, or buying a new refrigerator. All of these investments will pay for themselves on a monthly basis in energy savings. Each electric ratepayer will also be informed of the availability of efficiency loans through the Public Benefit Fund. To summarize, here are the benefits of establishing an innovative inverted utility rate structure in North Carolina. Ratepayers who take steps to conserve energy and or invest in efficiency in their homes, businesses, and industries will realize substantial economic gains in the form of lower energy bills and higher profits. The massive investment in energy efficiency and renewable energy systems resulting from the economic incentives built into this new rate structure will create thousands of new jobs throughout the state. Burning coal to produce electricity has been directly linked to childhood asthma, emphysema in the elderly, mercury toxicity resulting in neurological damage, heart and lung disease in people of all ages. By enabling the phasing out of polluting power plants in the region, the new rate structure will result in universally improved health for the people who live in this region. The new rate structure will result in improved air quality, reduced water consumption, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, reduced mountaintop removal coal mining, reduced oil and natural gas drilling, and reduced nuclear waste. Once a 100% renewable transformation is completed, 
all of this environmental destruction can be eliminated, or at least the part that takes place for the sake of meeting North Carolina's energy needs. And finally, the new rate structure will be of major benefit to the state and local governments of North Carolina, as it provides increased revenues from sales taxes, increased income tax collections, and reduced unemployment and health care liability. For more information about this innovative utility rate restructuring proposal and to download a petition to North Carolina's elected and appointed officials, visit www.canarycoalition.org. Join this campaign and work for a real solution. Thank you for caring and taking the time to watch this presentation.